Hi everyone, uh, welcome back to part two of this lecture on 19th century landscape painting and national identity. We're going to move on in the lecture guide down to Ather Asher B. Durand um, and start with this painting here, which was a memorial painting, by the way, called Kindred Spirits. Uh, after Thomas Cole died, and by this point in the uh, later 1840s, Thomas Cole is is kind of a, um, a major icon in American landscape painting, uh, the so-called founder of the Hudson River School, the person who everyone was not really competing with because they just believed this guy was, you know, by far the head of the pack. But after he died, the person everyone wanted to... Um, to supplant, to take his place. And Asher B. Duran, uh, you know, wanted that as well. So what he shows here is, of course, Thomas Cole, and then next to him, William Cullen Bryant, the famous literary figure, uh, next to him in the Catskills, um, you know, basically contemplating and talking about the beneficence of nature. I'm going to go through some of these fairly quickly because as with um, a lot of things in this class, what I'm trying to do is spend, let's say, a lot of time on some of the bigger characters and maybe every once in a while spend for each one of these artists a bit more time visually analyzing and talking about the specific details of their works. And then much of the time, I just want to show you some further examples of these works, point out a couple of basic things with them. When you're Taking notes on this stuff really key into the works that I'm spending a lot of time with, but oftentimes ideas that I um, that I promote or that I discuss in relation to these works of art that you just spend a little bit of time with are applicable to the bigger works of art. In other words, I I want to give you on the one hand a lot of depth about major examples. But I also want to show you that these major examples are part of a bigger field of work and give you a little bit of sense of that. And instead of boring you to death uh, by saying the same thing over and over again and spending countless hours on lectures with every single work, I'm assuming you can take ideas that you saw or that we broached in front of works that I spent a lot of time with and apply them to the smaller works and vice versa. So, uh, actually, let me get in here close on, on this. So, if we go in on Thomas Cole and William Cullen Bryant, there you see these two men out in nature, right at the edge of this rock with the Catskill Mountains in the background, nature all around them. And, of course, this was their, um, nature was their, um, their idea of God. Ashby Duran, for the most part, painted scenes, as we saw with Thomas Cole, of nature with very, very little um, narrative involved in them. An example of this is this work from 1855 called In the Woods. Uh, Asher B. Duran actually early in his life trained as an engraver. He worked, and I think his family did as well, uh, for the U.S. Treasury in the Mint Department, actually creating the engravings for um, notes for, uh, for money. Uh, but he quickly went uh, beyond that and started painting these scenes of nature. Again, not to spend too much time on this, but like everyone else, he is a pantheist. Like everyone else, he believes these pristine, beautiful renditions of nature are something that is particular to the United States. And so when you looked at these, it wasn't just about, wow, look at the skill of the artist at rendering nature with such fidelity. The nature had significance, right? Nature meant this is what we are as a nation. This is a manifestation of the divine. And frankly, for someone like Duran, um, even more so than Cole, he is interested in amazing amounts of detail on the works that he represents. Uh, it's his way of paying homage to God, paying homage to his complexity, and really rendering a scene that makes you feel, when you looked at it, like you were vicariously in these woods. It is absolutely worth mentioning that in addition, in addition to all the reasons that I've given you so far that the landscape paintings and the land itself, nature and its pristine state, was so important and significant at this time, 
think of people on the eastern seaboard now working in cities that were getting bigger and bigger and nature is feeling like it's further and further away. More and more of the eastern seaboard is being uh, civilized, so to speak, and so more and more of nature is going away. All of the painters you've seen so far, and this will be the case until we get up to Albert Bierstadt, uh, are basically painting on this side of the Mississippi River. They're not going out beyond that, even though stories are coming back from Lewis and Clark about all the endless tracts of nature that exist all the way out to the Pacific Ocean. They haven't seen any of that. So if you're sitting on the eastern seaboard, let's say you're working in a city, you made some money uh, in your business, maybe you're not seeing nature as much as you want, and this becomes the first time, by the way, that people start buying landscape paintings and putting it in their office buildings so that they can have a vicarious experience of nature and by extension God and feel proud to be an American within the confines of their own, uh, you know, uh, businesses and interiors. Another work by Asher B. Durand, again, not to belabor the point. These are beautiful, luminous paintings. If you've never seen a landscape painting in oil, uh, which of course is the preferred method, they are luminescent. They, they really reflect light. They can be, you know, oils can be um, really worked up to show you a ton of detail. This one's called The Beaches. And in this case, you have a little bit of a kind of pastoral scene of a shepherd moving his flock in towards town, one believes. Remember that for a lot of people, these are little hidden symbolisms of America as the new Eden. Um, we talked about this a little bit before when we were talking about that painting uh, of Daniel Boone leading the people through the Cumberland Gap. Here is a, sh a, fl a shepherd moving his flock into town from nature. That's a, a kind of allusion to Jesus as the shepherd. I, however, on this painting, just wanted to show you some of the details. So I'm gonna keep getting you in closer on some of these paintings. This is, uh, sorry, the last one was called The Beaches. This one's called Creek in the Woods. Same thing, pristine, beautiful uh, nature there for us and get you in a little bit closer on the beaches or on this log here. Now we're, you're basically looking at, I don't know what your screen's like, how big it is, but you're looking at a scene that's been blown up exponentially to show you some of the detail of a Durand painting. The painting of Durand's that I want to spend the most time on, however, is this work called Progress. Now, progress is, as you're reading, your reserve reading points out, almost a virtual ode to manifest destiny. An idea, of course, that we've been talking about to some degree, very ensconced in the, the idea of progress itself. So, in a sense, what we're getting is a bit of the opposite of what we got in the Thomas Cole's Course of Empire series. This is one that extols progress. Uh, uh, progress, excuse me. It's very common to set it up this way, and we saw it in the Oxbow River, which is, by the way, alluded to in this work. You're up on a promontory, so a hill, and you're looking out over the progress of civilization. The way that this one works, though, is here, the first thing that you see is unblemished, unblemished natural landscape, right? Hallmark of pantheism the spot in which Native Americans uh, lived forever and stayed savage. And here we've got the Native Americans looking out over this promontory towards civilization unfolding. Guess, what kind of Native American stereotype is this? Well, you guessed it, I'll bet. They're the doomed Indian. They're not fighting back. They don't have at war implements and they're looking for revenge like a demonic Indian. They're not seen so close or partaking in civilization to make them a noble savage. They're the doomed race witnessing the advance of civilization before them and accepting their fate. If we go down here to the far, far um, bottom right-hand corner, what you start to see is the beginnings of civilization or the beginnings of progress. There are people moving their livestock into a country store um, that country store, of course, is a place that everyone on the frontier would go to trade for things that they need. 
uh, or to bring, in this case, their uh, livestock in to sell. We see the beginnings of telegraph poles here as well, showing you the advance of technology. And then as we move our way down the road to the shoreline, we see one after another steps towards greater progress. The next step is this. Right here, we see a harbor. I'm going to get you in a little bit closer on this. In that harbor, you see a, the beginnings of a city. So a harbor, some boats in here, a dock on the shore here, a city starting to emerge with a church here. Notice how the church steeple is surrounded by nature. That's a way that the artist can show you about pantheism, God being part and parcel of nature. So you, let's say you start with the savage state, then you build little homesteads and you have country stores. And then the next step is you've got a little bit bigger city and then follow the shoreline forward way off in the distance. You see a big city, a metropolis with steamboats out here factory smoke coming out of these uh, smokestacks, uh, bigger buildings, and so forth. That's the advance of civilization. That's manifest destiny, right? Making use of these natural resources step by step to get to an ever bigger uh, city. Now, while we're here, I want to point out something that's really important because if you think about this, if what he's saying is that, uh, you know, building these big cities, kind of like in Thomas Cole's Course of Empire, the consummation of empire is our goal. If that's what he's saying, then why isn't the big city in the foreground? Why do we show the savage state in the foreground, so to speak? And the answer is that, of course, that savage state of pristine nature is the thing that makes us different from Europe. It's the thing that fosters ideas about pantheism and God and as part and parcel in nature. It's also the fuel that gives rise to progress. It's the thing that matters. This is the thing that makes us different. So you put this in the foreground. This is, you know, all the things that matter about nature that will give us the possibility of progress in big cities. But the other thing is equally important. It's just a practical concern in a way. If everything that's significant about nature, everything that makes us different is up here in the left hand side, if this is all that matters, then you've got to emphasize that over a big city, which doesn't represent any of those ideas. People on the Eastern Seaboard were already a little bit worried about what was going to happen with progress and industrialization. After all, if we were trying to set ourselves apart from Europe, do we really want to create cities, uh, huge cities and, and huge factories the same way as Europe? What would make us different from them then? In this scene, we have the same idea, but we're really just focusing on that, uh, that first stage of civilization. This is a work that's called The First Harvest, also by Asher B. Durant. Now we're out kind of in the frontier. It doesn't tell you exactly where we are, but we're clearly off of the eastern seaboard. And what we witness here is the first steps of cultivating the land. If God has given us this land, right, to make use of at a kind of individual level, this is what it looks like. It's the pioneer, that earliest of our national heroes. And what this pioneer has done is he's cut down the trees to build his bridge and to build his house. And now he is cultivating a field in order to plant um, his harvest. Over here is his livestock. God has given us everything we need. This land gives us the fuel for both our national growth as well as our individual growth. And over and over again, scenes like this will, will basically be showing you um, that unfolding. Remember as well that in this stage, you know, we've got a pretty good balance between nature and civilization or nature and someone putting that nature to use. If you're wondering about why this looks so dark in stages or why it, it looks slightly ominous, um, it's worth saying that to be a pioneer was to be 
heroic, that God put all this stuff here for you to use, but it wasn't necessarily going to be easy. You're going to have to be brave. You're going to have to work hard and diligently. Remember all those ideas we talked about in the first lecture? They're still around. And there will be obstacles placed in your path. But if you follow God, if you follow these kind of moral rules that are in place under pantheism, God will reward you, in this case, not by mercantilism, which is what we saw way back with the freak portraits, but by giving you all of the fuel that, again, through your industri industriousness, through your hard work, through your maintaining your allegiance to God and so forth, will allow you to prosper. Remember, all these ideas about progress we talked about before when we were talking about Thomas Crawford's The Progress of Civilization. So then just one quick point to make about something that I think um, you know, is important to emphasize. Remember, I just said that on the Eastern Seaboard, civilization is rapidly growing. This leads to a little bit of anxiety about what the world is going to look like in a little while. Are we going to lose our sense of self with our loss of nature? So just a point to be made, and it's a point that's made in one of your optional readings. This is a work called Staruka Viaduct in Pennsylvania by Jasper Cropsey. It's in Pennsylvania and Staruka Viaduct was a viaduct for a train that ran the entire length of the valley. It was a marvelous feat of engineering and people flocked to see, you know, American engineering at its best, right? Look at how we transverse this beautiful valley um, with our feat of engineering. It was a, it, it made a huge visual impact on the landscape, however, and a lot of people worried about, again, that. Too much growth. But notice how the artist here has minimized the viaduct. He hasn't gotten us up close on it. He, we're not right down there below it. He's kind of blended it into the landscape. Now, the argument that, we'll, that art historians have made, and it's pretty convincing, it's not ex always the case, but pretty convincing is that when progress is shown, such as this engineering feat, the viaduct itself, when it is shown on the eastern seaboard in some place like Pennsylvania, you'll minimize its impact a little bit. You'll point to it, but you won't you know, hit someone over the head with the visualization of that, um, that progress. If, however, like this work by Andrew Melrose, that progress is set somewhere out you know, off of the eastern seaboard. In this case, this is called Westward the Star of Empire Makes Its Way Near Council Bluffs, Iowa. And if you were on the eastern seaboard, you're probably thinking, I don't know where the hell Council Bluff, Iowa is anyway. It must be somewhere out there in the endless expanses of the west. Then if the scene is set out there, you do not need to minimize the impact of progress. This is, again, progress. Off to the left-hand side, you've got a little homestead, just like Asher Brady Duran's work. He cut down the trees to make his house. He's getting ready to plow his field. Coming directly towards us is the Star of Empire. It's a, a rail line, uh, a particular one, bearing right down at us. It's basically saying, in this case, the train represents progress, right? Trains are forms of industry there uh, you know it's the way that we're going to transport those natural resources from the west uh, back to the eastern seaboard and put them to use it's bearing right down at us we don't have to worry about the impact of progress out west because this is the belief of the time the west goes on forever we'll never use up all the resources that are uh, at our disposal because again it just seems to go on forever to people. One of my favorite artists uh, of the 19th century in landscape painting is this man, Frederick Church. 
Frederick Edwin Church was the only student that Thomas Cole ever had. Uh, he certainly admired, it was a mutual admiration. He is extraordinarily gifted at detailed works and very smart with his compositions. Um, these are things that aren't really worth talking about with slides, but if you get a chance to see his work, spend some time really looking at all of the details that are in the painting. For instance, this work, Niagara, which is his probably his most famous work. Um, if you get right up to the water's edge and you look at that water, you'll see about six, seven, eight different values of blues and greens uh, in a way that, that really kind of makes you think water. Water is notoriously difficult to, um, to render uh, as an artist and he nails it. So Niagara Falls. This was a subject that landscape painters have been painting um, at this point for a long time. In fact, again, some art historian who was very interested in church spent the time necessary to figure out at least a hundred different versions of Niagara Falls existed by the time that Frederick Church painted this scene. Now, why did they flock to this? It's a amazing natural wonder, right? It's glorious. It is a manifestation of the sublime, this big, powerful waterfall, all of the power and energy of that, uh, you know, force of nature. It's also majestic and beautiful and something that, again, we could point to as one of our national treasures and say, this is, you know, American. Never mind that half of it's in Canada, by the way. Um, and so people loved it, right? People loved it. And just like the Catterskill Falls, it already had lodges around it. They're everywhere around it today, uh, which again, uh, this artist has chosen not to represent. The problem was that as a painter, when you're painting a scene, um, it's really difficult to get this giant horseshoe falls. It's a massive panorama, of course, and it's notoriously difficult for photographers to get it even today. But Church has a brilliant solution to this problem. And here's, here's how you see it. He doesn't, like so many artists had before, put you at the bottom looking directly at the falls. What he does is he puts you at the edge of the, the falls itself on one side, looking out over the falls to the other side. So you both get kind of the perilousness of standing at the edge of the falls and all that energy and detail of the water frothing up and so forth and you get a look out over the falls coming down on the other side. Once he had come up with this problem to the composition that allowed you to render the, the magnitude of the falls, artist after artist after artist copied him, which is why this is so familiar. Um, Church, again, was a pantheist. He was someone who was really interested in Alexander von Humboldt's uh, writings, which we talked about when we were talking about um, um, Carl Bodmer. Um, remember the artist who represented Native Americans very accurately and came to the United States at the request of a German uh, um, naturalist who was a devotee of Alexander von Humboldt. Well, Church read of all of uh, von Humboldt's writings in Cosmos. He was really interested in his exploration of nature and he fused that together with his own pantheistic ideas about God being inherent in nature. See, Humboldt being more of a scientist would be talking about things like how natural climates and microclimates is what we would call them today fostered the growth of particular plant life which in turn fostered the particular eating habits and uh, you know, building structures and clothing and colors of dyes that various Native American peoples uh, used. In other words, von Helmholt saw the entire network of nature being uh, very mutually dependent upon one thing leading to the other thing and so forth. And then, of course, Church saw this as a manifestation of the complexities of God as well. Further, though, Frederick Church was really interested in just the practical artistic consideration of light and how to capture light. So over and again, he will paint scenes. Again, everything that I've talked about so far in terms of pantheism and so forth apply here. But in addition to that, in this work called Twilight, for instance, from the mid 1850s, it's really concerned with the effect of a particular type of light 
you know, with clouds around, twilight just occurring, uh, and how to capture that in his rendition of nature. Another example of an interest in light, we've all seen it before, when a storm comes through and it's just opened up and you get that strange light coming through. This one is called the passing storm. Or, again here, a work called Sunset, all the strangeness and beauty of light. Vast skies, reflective surfaces, this is again God being part and parcel, kind of unifying all natural phenomena. He's also pretty famously interested in, this is called the Aurora Borealis, right? The beautiful effect of the lights of the Northern Lights. It's also very interested, as many people have pointed out, in how this uh, you know, manifestation of nature and of pantheism and so forth was a part of our national identity. This is a work that is probably his most recognized work called Twilight in the Wilderness from 1860. And you look at this and you, again, it's about light. It's about the beautiful power of nature and pantheistic ideas, a manifestation of the sublime with the vastness of the sky and the breadth of the horizon and so forth. But if you look at the clouds a little bit more closely, people have pointed out they look like the, the, the stripes and maybe even the stars off here in the distance of the flag. And you'll see this in a moment even more clearly. In other words, he's identifying nature with this nation through the flag, right? So here's where it is even more obvious our banner in the sky from 1861 in which the sky itself seems to look like a flag or let's say on the other end of the this one's super obvious um out the work that's called our flag from 1864. many of these by the way the more you read about them uh, art historians oftentimes associate these with an enduring kind of nationalism during the time of incredible upheaval of the Civil War and, um, you know, someone like Church trying to reassert the endurance of the national spirit despite uh, its fracturing around this momentous war. My favorite paintings, though, are the ones that he created that, frankly, aren't even about um, North America. This is uh, from South America. He went on a couple of trips uh, to South America um, in the 50s, early 50s, and this is one of his most famous huge paintings called The Heart of the Andes. Uh, again, the detail of this is glorious, the vastness uh, and beauty of nature. He had just read Alexander von Humboldt's passages in the cosmos, talking again about things like you know, particular trees grow in particular climates that then that wood is used for uh, various different um, things by the indigenous cultures of that area who then use the roots and so forth to dye their fabrics and on and on and on. So he wanted to go see this stuff firsthand. The scene that you see here is so remarkable, um, I think, because of the way it was displayed if you're wondering a little bit about like how do these artists show their works, there are no major museums at this time. There are a couple of academies to the arts, the New York Academy of Design and the Pennsylvania Academy of the Arts that will put on kind of intermittent exhibitions. But the major way that artists showed their works is that they rented out storefronts and invited people to come see these, um, oftentimes to of course sell them. And in this case, after he came back from his trip, by the way, artists didn't paint these huge scenes when they were out in the field. They would take sketches and notes and, and basically little, uh, little component parts of a, a bigger work would be made in the field. And then they'd come back to their studios and paint up these massive paintings. This one's 12 plus feet across. In this case, he painted this entire scene and then to display it, he actually invited people in and he covered the sides of it with a curtain so that it looked like you were looking into the actual scene itself. 
so that it was really, really theatrical. And then once you got into the gallery interior, he actually had collected samples of the earth and of rocks and of fabrics dyed by particular native groups in this area, so that it become, became almost like a naturalist um, lesson about nature rather than just about painting or visual arts. Now I want to get you up here close on a couple of things because again this painting is big it's you know 12 ish feet across um, but there's tons of detail here. The cross that you see here in the immediate foreground is one of the direct kind of emblems or symbols of pantheism and the place that he 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 signed this is equally kind of um, compelling. It's over here on this tree, and I'll be honest with you, I, I took my daughter to see this painting. I have I've been dragging her into museums since she was a little kid, and she's, as you might imagine, um, less than excited every time dad drags her into a museum, but I was showing her this one, and she's like, yeah, yeah, it's a landscape painting, but she was really excited when I showed her uh, you know, the details of this getting up close. This is a, a passage in the painting that is now blown up to about three times the size uh, that you would see it in the painting itself. So tons of detail there. Here's where he signed it. This is my daughter's favorite point. Uh, it's as if he engraved on a tree with a knife. It says 1859 and then uh, F Church. And then there's a close-up of the cross and all that magnificent detail here. Just one more scene by Frederick Edwin Church of this, uh, again, trip to, uh, to South America. This is called Season in the Tropics. And once again, that beautiful detail. This is the lower right-hand side of, and again, for Church, the clothing that these people wear, their, uh, their culture itself has derived from their particular microclimate, right? This is something he took from Humboldt. The final, well, the final major artist for today is Albert Bierstadt. Albert Bierstadt was um, born in the United States, if I remember correctly, uh, to German emigres. But in his teens, he returned to Germany for a while after doing a little bit of painting in order to train a little bit further at what's known as the Academy of Dusseldorf or what became the Academy of Dusseldorf. So he um, was very highly trained uh, in Europe. He is the first of the painters, he's very ambitious, to head out west. And that's what you're seeing here in a way. It's a a sketch called The Surveyor's Wagon in the Rockies from 1859. He hooked up with a, a, a man that was a general in the Civil War, Frederick uh, Lander, uh, who was also, after the war, a U.S. surveyor. The U.S. surveyors were basically going out further and further west to see what we had, and by the way, to start stake some claims to areas that were um, also being claimed by what is now Canada. Uh, and so he hooked up with him so that he could go out west, take sketches of scenes uh, of what could be found out west and work those up into giant oil paintings back here on the eastern seaboard uh, for, for you know patrons. So he's the first of the major artists to actually head out west. And over and over again, for reasons that, you know, a lot of people think are controversial, um, he would paint the scenes of what you would find out west uh, as Arcadian, as utopian, as the promised land. After all, if America was the new Eden, the west coast and what you could find out there should be something we should all flock to. The reason that people find this a bit controversial is that uh, our Bierstadt was basically uh, having his way funded by the U.S. government, at least to some degree, and by the way, by railroad companies that have a vested financial interest in getting people to move out west um, so that you would have basically a workforce. Um, and so people see a little bit of a conflict of interest in him painting kind of rosy scenes of what you could find out west when it wasn't really all that easy of a life at this time. So for instance, here, 
you see a scene that's called Oregon Trail. And again, you've got beautiful nature, you've got people working in harmony, um, you know, caravanning out west. There's no troubles at all, no storms, no famine, no pestilence, no Native American groups waiting to pick you off and so forth. It's, it's all, a, it looks like a big kind of camp scene. Maybe his most famous painting on this subject of going out west, right? And I, I want to emphasize this. At this time, the west was basically um, a symbol or a big um, kind of beacon call towards progress. Out west, endless tracts of pristine landscape. Out west, all of that fuel for our nation and for you as an individual. It's during the time that... You know, we're going to get into the land grabs and lots of, um, you know, giving away of land to any settler who can get out there and claim their stake. Uh, and Albert Bierstadt is promoting that. Now, I want to pause here to say he's not promoting it in my mind because he's getting a, you know, his way paid to go out west. And thus it's a kind of quid pro quo, so to speak. He's promoting it because it makes perfect sense for him to extol the beauty and the magnificence and the promise of landscape painting and the landscape because he is a painter. Or another way to put this is his, his goals line up perfectly with railway companies and the U.S. government that has a vested interest in getting people to move out west because he wants to make the west look glorious too. That's how people are going to remember him as a great painter, and buy his paintings. So in this work called Emigrants Crossing the Plains, you see some pretty standard hallmarks of, uh, you know, emigrating west. It's, this looks like a scene that later on could be in, uh, you know, cowboy movies from the 50s, 60s, 70s, and beyond. Everyone's in their covered wagons. They're moving out west with their animals and with their families. Uh, you see bones uh, on the ground to let you know it's not going to be easy, but they are minimized. It's like that's that's minor compared to the glory that awaits you beyond. The sunset itself is a scene, uh, you know, that that is supposed to let you know that, um, you know, there's God. You're moving towards God on the horizon, the light being God. And this is, again, your your tomorrow, your future. When he shows you scenes of Native Americans, like this one, Indians traveling near Fort Laramie, um, he always, almost always, minimizes any potential threat. Remember what I said, following the Civil War, the Indian Wars are, are already starting, and conflicts between Plains Indians and the U.S. government are big news around um, that might be something that would dissuade you from moving out west if you were an immigrant, um, but, you know, he minimizes that, showing you a kind of peaceable group of people over and over again. His most famous painting, a painting that when he sold it, he got $25,000 for, which is an astronomical price for a painting at this time, is Rocky Mountain's Lander's Peak. Lander's Peak is named after Frederick Lander, who had traveled uh, out west with in 1859, um, and here it is. Up until this point, there were no real pictures of the Rocky Mountains. You're going to have photographers come back with some photos around the same time as this, but believe it or not, photography was a poor substitute for these oil paintings that someone like Bierstadt would produce because photographs at their biggest size, they couldn't enlarge them, by the way. So even these artists that were working with what are called mammoth plates, these giant 20 to 25 inch by 25 inch pieces of glass would come back with black and white images of these scenes and they wouldn't impress anyone really. Here's Bierstadt bringing back pictures of what people had only heard about in the stories of people like uh, Lewis and Clark. And here were the gigantic, completely impressive, sublime mountains of the Rockies. Whereas Europeans for a long time had said, you know, look at our grandeur in the Swiss and uh, French, I'm sorry, the Swiss and the Italian Alps in particular, up into Germany as well. 
Um, you know, Americans didn't really have much to point to at this stage. The Appalachian Mountains aren't, they, well, they're just not as impressive as the Rockies. So here's Bierstadt being able to say, look at, we've got something that's every bit as magnificent as the Alps out in the Rockies, and he maximizes that effect here. He also shows you the beauty of a waterfall, endless, pristine nature, the, the expanses of the sky, right? This is the sublime. This is pantheism and God inherent in nature. This is the promised land. This is the new Eden. This is our nation. You know, wow, look at what we've got. Look at how proud we can be of this and look at what we can do and use from this. Notice that he's shown the Native Americans. This is actually a Shoshone encampment in the foreground. And we're right up there into the picture plane in their business, so to speak. And they're not threatening at all. They're not threatened by us either. Now we come to a kind of representation of Native Americans that it kind of partakes of the noble savage, but it's not quite that. That is um, a little bit different than what we've seen so far. It's as if what Bierstadt is saying is that out west with this endless expanse, a pristine landscape, there's room for all of us to coexist. You won't have the conflicts that we have on the eastern seaboard that have led to, again, the Indian Removal Act in 1830, Trail of Tears, uh, endless marches, reservations, lots of conflict. Out west, if we just keep pushing in that direction, there will be room for all of us to exist peacefully together. So it's its own justification for the, the incredibly horrible ways that we're treating these groups by saying, yeah, yeah, but we're giving them these areas in the plains that are beautiful and pristine and their way of life goes on just the same as it always had. A couple other things I want to say about this work, though, is that Landers Peak and like just about everything Bierstadt did, um, what we're looking at is not a realistic representation of, of this part of the world. It's not him, uh, you know, accurately representing what he saw. What he's doing is he's making up a naturalistic or, you know, semi-fictitious account of what he sh saw to emphasize particular things. The majesty of the mountains, the peacefulness of the Native Americans, the gloriousness and pristineness of nature. Um, when, of course, it didn't quite look like that entirely. In fact, I should just say this. In this scene um, of Lander's Peak, as your text or your reserve reading points out, he's tweaked the way that Lander's Peak actually looks to make it look like the Matterhorn, which was the most kind of significant peak in the Alps. It's like he's saying, we've got a Matterhorn here too. Take that, Germany. I cut through a couple of these fairly quickly, right? Just more scenes of the same stuff. This is uh, in at Lake Tahoe, right? Bringing back pictures of things that no one had yet seen but had heard about in the uh, the reports of Lewis and Clark or trappers or 49ers, um, you know, gold uh, rush people. Scene here of uh, the Valley of Yosemite. He is one of the first to go to the areas that will later become the national parks. Or the view of Donner Lake in California. The Buffalo Trail. So kind of nostalgic scenes of pristine landscape and American bison that was, by the way, very quickly disappearing. Uh, for reasons that I'll go into here. In this work, um, near the end of his career from 1888, uh, he paints a scene that he titles The Last of the Buffalo. And what we're witnessing here, of course, is um, a Native American who is hunting a bison, very, very romantically displayed as if he's still hunting this bison while on a horse. Uh, with a lance instead of the way that Native Americans would have hunted at this stage, which is primarily with rifles, not exclusively, but primarily. And then he titles the whole thing, The Last of the Buffalo. Now, of course, 
if you take this the wrong way, you'll think that he's being massively historically inaccurate by ascribing to Native Americans the almost uh, you know, decimation of the American bison. I think many of you know that the American bison or buffalo was almost eradicated, all, almost went extinct after stories, of course, early on of settlers saying you could go out to these plains and look out over the valley and the valley would look like it's moving because there are millions of these bison just wandering the plains eating. Of course, Native Americans had used the bison as uh, a major natural resource for years and it lived in harmony. So it's hardly the case that Native Americans called the, caused the decimation of these animals. What actually occurred is that um, both traders seeking out their uh, various parts of the buffalo, particularly their pelts, um, shot them, stripped them, and left them to rot in the fields. Um, sometimes the U.S. Army, in order to starve Native Americans, would decimate entire herds of buffalo, up to 10,000 buffalo at a time. It was even the case that for fun, people would ride on the back of um, trains, open wagons, uh, with their rifles out, and just indiscriminately shoot bison for sport. But that's not what Bierstadt is saying. He's not saying the Native Americans fictitiously killed these bison. What he's trying to do is say, it's not just the last of the buffalo, it's the last of this image of Native Americans. It's the last of the life of Native Americans um, before they go extinct, so to speak, almost like the bison. What he's doing is he's showing you a scene of this mag magnificent hunt, the rearing horse, the Native American in all of his regalia, and he's saying, in 1888, this way of life is almost gone, right? This is part of what James Clifford called the salvage paradigm, now in visual form. I want to preserve the magnificence and glory of this way of life in this painting. Remember how I said before, too, that this strange ambivalence that people had about Native Americans, on the one hand, being fascinated by their exoticism, really curious about their ways of life, even being proud uh, to share an earth with people who are so heroic and, and kind of ingenious when it came to um, some of their ways of operating in the world, more often than not, when push came to shove, would be um, would easily be convinced to, uh, you know, rob them of their lands or push them off their ancestral territories and so forth. So in this case, you can preserve an image of these people without having to deal with their real personhood. Final artist I just wanted to show you very briefly is Thomas Moran. Thomas Moran was of the generation kind of right after uh, Albert Bierstadt of artists, many of whom went out west. He actually went out west with the U.S. Geological Survey team. He was very close friends with William Henry Jackson, who was an, a very famous U.S. Geological Surveyor who was a photographer. And he was famous for carrying around these massive, what are called mammoth plates to get scenes uh, or I'm sorry, to shoot photos of these incredible scenes of, in particular, the areas that will become uh, the, the famous uh, national parks of the United States. So in Thomas Moran's work, what you're looking at here is the Great Blue Spring of the Lower Geyser Basin in Yellowstone. It uh, uh, you know, shows you the, the beauty and the strangeness of this part of the world. These are massive, massive paintings. Uh, he was doing these primarily for the U.S. government, although he also sold these on the side. Or this scene here of, uh, the again, the Yellowstone Valley. And just to, again, show you what this looks like, in a photograph on the right is the same photograph or the same area photographed by William Henry Jackson. The difference that you can't tell here, it's a strange difference too, not only is the color different, of course, you can see some of the manipulations that have happened in Moran's work, but the big difference is in real life, the photograph here is about this big and the painting is about 12 feet tall by eight feet wide. Well, again, 
think your way through these ideas. Think your way through how the major theories or ideas that I started this lecture out with um, fit into all of these landscape paintings. In this case, again, Thomas Moran is documenting scenes of areas that will later become federally protected as national treasures. These national parks that even today, again, hundreds of thousands of uh, people flock to every single year. Why did we preserve these areas, especially early on? Well, it wasn't for fear that they would go away. It was, or rather, it wasn't for fear that, um, you know, someone would try to build here. It was more for making them communally accessible to all of us in perpetuity to remind us of where we came from and what was kind of our basic idea of who we were as a nation. All right, until next week.